Okay, so I will go ahead and, um, and get us started. Um, thank you all so much for attending the webinar today on how to write a good peer review um, with AJE and presenting this, this information in this webinar today is Dr. Patrick Applegate, who is a geoscientist. Um, he earned his PhD from Pennsylvania State University um, and he is, um, has either been the first author or co-author on over 20 peer-reviewed um, published um, manuscripts. And, um, and he is passionate. This is a topic that he is passionate and very knowledgeable about. He currently is a team manager for, um, for Research Square, which he'll be able to share a little bit um, more about at the end of this presentation. Um, and so we are really excited to, to have him here and to be able to um, just share this information to, to help, um, you know, just kind of um, help re researchers as they provide peer reviews, um, you know, for their, their research communities. So Patrick, thank you so much for joining us today um, and I'll let you walk us through it. Great. Um, Teresa, thank you very much for that nice introduction. So yes, I am going to be talking about how to write uh, useful peer reviews in this webinar this morning. Um, Teresa mentioned some of this a minute ago as we were getting started, but in case you're just joining us, um, I want you to know that uh, we are very interested in any questions that you may have as um, I'm going through this material. Uh, with the way that we have the technology set up this morning, I'm not able to see and respond to your questions as I'm going through the talk. But Teresa, but please put those into either the chat or the Q&A section within Zoom uh, as I'm talking and we will circle back around to those um, as we get to the end. So Teresa will collect those and then uh, bring them up to me in a, a Q&A session uh, at the end of the talk. So we'll try to get through as many of those as we possibly can. I expect to talk for 30 to 40 minutes, so that should leave ample time um, for questions. So uh, just to sum up, uh, if you have questions, just uh, pop them into the chat window or the Q&A section, uh, and we will come back to those uh, at the end. So yes, I'm going to be talking about how to write a good peer review today. Um, this uh, talk is being given through AJE, AJE uh, American Journal Experts. I suspect that a lot of you are very familiar with the services that AJE offers to um, individual researchers. So we do uh, language editing in particular, but then also a range of other services like translation. Um, it turns out that AJE is part of a larger company called Research Square, and the other half of the company is focused on providing services to publishers primarily. Um, I sit over on the other side of the company, and uh, that experience um, gives me a lot to talk about on this particular subject of how to write a good peer review. So uh, that's my relationship to AJE um, and also uh, the topic that we're going to be discussing today. <clears throat> Uh, sorry, I'm just, yes, okay. So, um, as Teresa was mentioning, um, I think that my qualifications um, make it so that I'm able to say useful things about this topic. Uh, I do have a doctoral degree from, from a major American university and uh, have been involved in the publication process from the author side, which is the side from which many of you have likely uh, encountered this process most often. Uh, so like many of you, I've spent time as a researcher and instructor, uh, and I've also uh, done some work as a scientific programmer, uh, which is an increasingly important area. But uh, in my work over on the um, editorial services side of Research Square, I now oversee a team and uh, that team is responsible for coordinating peer reviews. So we work with publishers and help them to um, get in the peer reviews that they need to uh, publish the manuscripts that authors like you uh, send to them. And we'll talk about um, how this process works here a little further on in the talk. But uh, I think that I've skipped past the slide here and here is that slide. Um, so I want to lead off and then also finish this discussion with an explanation of what the main points of this talk are. 
And so what is the point of this talk? There are three points. First of all, I think that many people, when they begin to do peer reviews, um, they perhaps falsely believe that their role is simply to serve as a gatekeeper, to say whether individual contributions that are subject, uh, submitted to journals, whether those should be published or not. But really, uh, so that's the gatekeeper role. You're trying to keep bad science out of the literature. But as a peer reviewer, you also have an important role as a coach where you are trying to help the authors of the manuscripts that you review to improve their work. And so that is why I've said here uh, that when you're a reviewer, you're both a coach, you're trying to help the authors of the paper and you're a gatekeeper. You're trying to help the editor who is responsible for the paper to decide whether it should be published. So both of those roles together are quite important. You're contributing to the quality of the scientific literature by providing your expertise to help authors improve their papers and to uh, help editors keep bad stuff out of the literature. So uh, in doing all of this, you're helping uh, three different groups of people the largest group is society, uh, since uh, scientific papers are used to make, by people, real people, to make decisions. Um, and if any way in which you contribute to the quality of the literature helps society. Uh, obviously, the comments that you provide on manuscripts help authors to improve their papers, and so you're helping them. These are people that are just like you. They want to get published um, to advance their own careers. But you're also helping yourself, and that is by seeing all of these papers that you review, uh, you get a sense of how to write a good paper and also what areas are seen as being really interesting and exciting in your own field. So um, you help all these different groups uh, by doing peer review. So that's a bit about why you should do peer review. Now, if you wanna participate in this process, it's kind of a don't call us, don't, we'll call you situation where editors will reach out to you um, to get your opinions on individual papers. And so if this is a process that you would like to contribute to, and I would argue that every scientist should, um, then the way to do that is to make sure that you have some kind of online presence that should include your publications, uh, your institutional affiliation and position, so what university you're associated with and, and what your role is there, and also your email address. Because if that information isn't readily accessible, people can't find you and you won't be invited to review. So that's the point of the talk. We'll come back to this at the end. Uh, I've already talked about this. Uh, so I suspect that most of you already know this, but just to be sure, um, we should say a few words about what peer review is. So um, taking the definition here from Wikipedia, um, so it says peer review is the evaluation of work by one or more people with similar competencies as the producers of the work, and that's the peer part, right? Um, and then further on in the article, it says, peer review is often used to determine an academic paper's suitability for publication. This is what most people mean when they talk about peer review. They're talking about its connection to the literature, and you'll notice here that this definition is mostly about the gatekeeper role that uh, reviewers fulfill. And we're gonna be talking a little bit about that role, but then also about the uh, coach role where you're helping authors to improve their work before it's published. So I wanna talk about why peer review matters in the first place. Why do we bother to do this since it's actually fairly laborious for both editors and also for reviewers. Uh, so here is a public language summary, an article about a research paper that has come out recently. I believe it's a meta-analysis. And so the title of this article that summarizes the original peer-reviewed paper is an anti-inflammatory diet, including coffee, chocolate, and red wine, could reduce your chances of dying early. Okay, well, so here in the United States, and I think probably in other places worldwide, uh, people really pay attention to this kind of literature and what is reported in the popular media. And they actually use that information to try to decide what they are going to eat. Uh, so you can imagine that when this article is published, probably there were some people who saw this and other summaries of it and said, well, I'm going to drink more coffee and drink more red wine and eat more chocolate because that should help me to live longer. 
that's great as long as the study that this uh, article is based on is actually correct, right? Otherwise, if coffee, chocolate, or red wine are actually harmful, and this paper just isn't picking up on that, uh, those people are going to be harmed, probably to some small degree, but there's still some harm associated with that poor decision making. Point here is that um, scientific articles are used by real people to make decisions, and the quality of the literature determines how good those decisions are going to be. So peer review is the process. You'll remember that scientists review papers before they are published. And the goal here is to try to ensure that uh, scientific studies that make it into the literature are as accurate as possible. So again, this is important on a societal level so that what is out there in the peer reviewed literature is a good basis for decision making. Now, having said that, uh, we need the, that is the scientific community needs peer reviewers, a lot of peer reviewers each year. Uh, so here is a graph that shows us uh, about the trend in the number of scientific articles that are published each year from two, over a decade, from 2006 to 2016. Uh, this is uh, part of a, a report that was written by a former colleague of ours, Ben Mudrak, who's now an American Chemical Society and doing great things there. Uh, but what you see is, um, I want to direct your attention to the to the blue to the green polygon, the blue polygon, and the red polygon down here at the bottom. So on the y-axis, we have uh, the number of articles, peer-reviewed articles that have been published in each year from 2006 to 2016. So if you look at the upper edges of these polygons, what you see is that um, in 2006, about a little over a million articles were published that year. But then by the time we got to 2016, about 2 million articles were published in 2016. And that's only continued to increase over the last couple of years. Um, the United States, as of 2016, was still the largest producer of peer-reviewed scientific articles, but that has since changed. So now China is the bigger, biggest producer of uh, scientific publications, and that's a great development. It's an important change in, in how uh, science is done and produced. But, okay, how does this then connect back to peer review? If you consider that every peer-reviewed publication needs to be reviewed by usually two scientists before it's published, then that suggests that about four million peer reviews need to be completed every year in order to sustain this volume of scientific publishing. That's a lot, considering that you know, there are only so many scientists in the world to do all of these reviews. Of course, people can complete multiple reviews in a year, but this still argues that there's a, a huge need for um, peer review in order to sustain all of the scientific publishing that's presently going on. So there's a great and growing need for peer review. Uh, periodically, as we're talking, I'll stop and summarize what I've said so far. Um, so what I've... Um, been discussing is that, of course, peer review is this process by which scientists uh, assess whether papers written by other people should be published. And the peer review part, the peer, indicates that the authors and the reviewers should work in the same field of study so that they have similar expertises. Um, the reason why we do this in the first place is because peer reviewed studies are used as a basis for decision making and um, we have to have some way of ensuring the quality of what makes it into the scientific literature. And uh, we need a lot of peer reviews every year in order to sustain the level of scientific publishing that we're seeing right now. So I wanna, having said all of that, I wanna take a step back and to uh, talk about something that I think all of you are probably very familiar with. So what is the role of publishing in an academic career? We're going to connect this back to peer review uh, in just a second. Um, probably all of you need to publish peer-reviewed papers. Okay, why is this? Well, the quantity and quality of the papers that you publish uh, determines how attractive you are seen as being for uh, grants. So, you know, the more high-impact papers that you have, the easier it is for you to get grant funding. 
uh, to do more work, but then also for your future positions. So as you move up the tenure track, if you're uh, in a position that has you doing that, the more high quality publications you have, the easier that will be for you. Um, so the reason why this matters for peer review is because when you serve as a peer reviewer, you are reviewing publications, potential publications for people who have the same goal that you have. They also want to move up the tenure track or to get their next job or to get their next grant. And in order to do that, they need to publish high quality papers as quickly as possible. So let's talk about the author side of this and then uh, another important player in the peer review process, the editor at a scientific journal. So uh, most of you are probably aware that as scientists, you write papers after you've done your research and then you submit it to a journal. And then the other red box on this slide here shows uh, the end stage of this process. So an editor eventually makes a decision on your paper and decides whether or not uh, that paper will be published in the journal that you've submitted it to or whether it will be rejected. Now, the peer reviewer, of course, where this whole talk is about peer reviewing, and so where does the peer reviewer fit in? Well, the reviewer is identified by the journal editor. The editor tries to find somebody with appropriate expertise for a given paper, and that person reads the paper, decides whether the study is sound, and then also writes up a list of suggestions for improving the paper, that's the coaching part, and sends that back to the editor. And then the author eventually receives those comments and hopefully uses them to improve the paper before the editor eventually makes uh, his or her final decision. So um, why does this matter? Well, um, I want to show you the full version of this um, graphic that I've been talking you through that comes from uh, a report. I've uh, cited it down here in the lower, oops, sorry in the lower right-hand corner, also by Ben Mudrak, but also a current colleague of ours, Jeff Grigston. Uh, and so you can see that the peer review process is fairly involved. Um, you know, I've shown you a small part of it here, but there are various other things that can happen to a manuscript as it's going through this process of being published. What matters for the authors of any given paper that you are trying to review, remember that they want to publish high impact stuff, quality papers, as quickly as possible. And so I've outlined in this red box here in the lower right hand corner, something that's not great for authors where if the journal editor decides that a paper needs to be reviewed again after the um, author has made changes to the paper, then he or she will send it, send it back to you for a second or third round of review. So uh, this is a process in which you as the reviewer try to determine whether the revised paper is now appropriate for publication. Um, point is that this eats up a, a lot of time. Uh, every time a paper is sent out for review, it costs months of the author's time, um, and, and this obviously slows down their publishing trajectory. So to summarize, um, again, your goal and your goal, uh, the goal of the people whose papers you're reviewing is that you want to publish high quality papers and you want to do that as fast as you possibly can. Um, the authors of any paper that you review have the same goal that you do. Now, when you're serving as a reviewer, there are a couple of things that you can do here that will help the authors of the paper to publish their work as, at as high a quality as possible, as fast as possible. Um, and the way that you can do this is by providing specific comments on, their, on the paper that help them to uh, improve their paper before it's published. Uh, and those suggestions need to be specific and actionable. Why is that? Well, uh, you know, when you provide these comments, the authors then have a chance to address them um, so that they can then make their paper better before it's publishable. And if your comments are, are such that it is easy for the editor to determine whether the authors have responded appropriately to your comments, then the paper can hopefully be published without needing additional rounds of review. So you 
will not need to review the paper again after the authors have changed it, and they can get their work published faster. So I will get into what makes a good peer review in just a second, but I want to uh, tell you a little bit about what makes a bad peer review first, all right? So uh, we see on the team that I help to supervise, we see hundreds of peer reviews every single month. And in our experience, the ones that the editors are least happy with tend to be very short. So we get in peer reviews from reviewers that we have found for particular articles, and we then send them back to journal editors who use them in making decisions about particular papers. Uh, the editors sometimes um, complain about the reviews that we have found, and uh, usually when they do so, the reviews are very, very short. So these are not actual reviews. I'm not sharing text from any, anything that anyone has sent back to us, but these are fairly representative of poor reviews that we get. So uh, let's take a few, let's pick up a few of these. So this paper is excellent and it should be published in its current form. Uh, that's fine if there's more there, but often this is all that a reviewer will send us. Similarly, this abstract is not properly formatted. Please rewrite it so that it includes introduction methods, results, and conclusion sections. And a third bad and very short review is, the authors have used the wrong method to address their question. The paper should be rejected. The point I wanna make here is that all of these comments are fine if they are part of a much longer review that provides detailed comments on an individual paper. If these comments by themselves are all that make up a given peer review, uh, a few things are going to happen. Remember that the editor is going to look at what you send back and they have to try to determine whether or not they believe you. So they've already determined that your expertise is likely appropriate for the paper, but it is not un unheard of for uh, scientists to be very busy and simply to not read something that they're sent for review very carefully or at all. Perhaps they just read the abstract and the title. And the editor is trying to make sure that uh, you have in fact read the whole paper and are providing a meaningful discussion of the strengths and weaknesses of an individual paper. So if all you say is that this paper is excellent and it should be published in its current form, the editor will wonder if you're just being nice to the authors and didn't have, if didn't have time to read the paper. So in that case, um, you're not really providing value here and you're not helping the authors. Uh, you're just meaning that the editor has now waited a while for your review and he or she is going to have to find someone else probably, or to come back and ask you for more comments on this particular manuscript. Uh, similarly, if all you do is to comment on the formatting of a paper, uh, the authors, if the authors see the comments and the editor are going to wonder, did you have sufficient expertise in the science to comment on the science? Peer review is ultimately about the quality of the science that's being presented. Uh, if you only talk about the formatting, um, they will wonder whether you really understood the paper, particularly if your review is critical otherwise. And finally, yeah, reviews that are critical and argue for rejection of a particular manuscript often are quite short. Uh, so if you think that the authors have just used the wrong method, then the science is thoroughly flawed and the paper should probably should be rejected but you should still take the time to say some more about um, specifically what's wrong with the paper or other things that could be corrected so that the authors have the opportunity to improve, if not this manuscript, future manuscripts. So having talked a little bit about what makes a poor peer review, they're usually really short, let's talk about some elements that go into a good peer review. So these slides will be distributed uh, to everyone who has signed up for this webinar. So uh, there's no need for you to try to write all of this down as I'm talking because you'll have it in front of you very shortly. Uh, so let's talk though about some things that make up a good peer review. Um, particularly if your review, if you know your review is going to be very short otherwise, 
uh, it's good to include a summary of the paper. It gives the editors and the authors uh, some confidence that you understood uh, the contribution that was being made. You should try to talk about how the paper adds to the literature and uh, whether or not the authors have done a good job of uh, talking about the existing literature. Then you talk about whether or not the paper should be published in its present form. And then you can start to talk about uh, the problems in the paper. So the biggest issues that a paper might have would have to do with the science. So if the science is incomplete or wrong in some way, you should certainly talk about that. Uh, in a separate section, you'll want to talk about problems in terms of how the science is presented. So those are potentially addressable issues, right? Uh, the science may be fine, but if the presentation isn't great, maybe the authors can improve that and then ultimately publish this particular contribution. And then uh, you'll want to include a detailed list of minor issues with a given paper. All of these things together make a really great peer review that the authors can learn from and the editor can have confidence in, in that you have done due diligence as a peer reviewer. We can talk through the individual elements of that list here. Uh, so your summary should try to address these questions. So what, you know, you should indicate that you understood the question that the authors were trying to answer, uh, that, the author, that you know what the authors did to try to answer the question, and what the major conclusions of the paper were. Uh, this can be just a very few sentences. Um, you don't have to recap the paper in detail, but some explanation indicating that you've clearly understood the science um, is certainly useful. And then uh, the contribution to the literature. Is this paper something new or um, have lots of other people done this same thing before? Uh, of course, an, el an important element of any scientific paper is acknowledging other work that other scientists have done. So if at this point you feel that um, the authors have not done a good job of acknowledging other papers that are important for this field of study, uh, this is a good place to mention those papers. Uh, so I meant, I say here, if references to key papers are missing, provide explicit citations to them. Um, it's often considered rude at this point if all of the papers you suggest are your own work. Uh, so try to minimize uh, self-citations at this point in the peer review process. Although, you know, if you've written the one most important paper on this topic and the authors haven't cited it, then uh, this is, it's, it's still appropriate to do that. Uh, so then after that, you provide your assessment of the publishability of the paper in its present state. So is the paper publishable without modification? So if the authors have produced something that's perfect in every way, you can say that uh, that's quite rare. Uh, even for really good manuscripts, usually the, the right answer is minor revisions. Uh, if the science is flawed but salvageable, then major revisions may, re may be required. Uh, if the science itself is flawed, then the work described in this paper is not publishable. So, you know, you've got kind of four options at this stage. Now, what you're trying to do, and I've alluded to this before, is you're trying to separate uh, the quality of the science from the quality of how it's presented. Um, if it's just a presentation issue, then, you know, you can, tr you can say, I think that this paper needs to be extensively revised, but the science in it appears to be a good contribution and I support its publication after those revisions are made. Now, authors at this point, or reviewers, I should say, very often want to include their opinion as to whether the paper should be published in this particular journal. But I would encourage you to um, leave that determination to the editor of the journal to which you've submitted the manuscript. They're usually more than happy to make that determination. If you focus on uh, the quality of the science and whether this paper could be published somewhere, they will then make a determination as to whether it should be published in their journal or whether they want to suggest to the authors that they send it somewhere else. So then you can talk about the quality of the science. So uh, if the authors have posed a, a question that's just not something that can be answered by scientific means, you should point that out. Um, if the methods are inappropriate, bring that up. 
Uh, and then are the conclusions reasonable? Sometimes authors will uh, do a perfectly reasonable study, but then the conclusions that they draw are too overblown or indeed have, don't go quite far enough in your opinion if you think that the work is very impactful. Uh, and these are all good places. This is a good place to bring all of those issues up. And then you can talk about the presentation. So is the paper appropriately structured? Uh, is the language clear and easy to follow? And are the figures clear? Uh, if any of those things are not uh, up to standard, uh, certainly bring those up. Finally, there's this list of minor issues. So uh, most papers have small issues, whether it's just a few misspellings here and there, uh, you know, just the wrong word choice occasionally. Uh, certain figures may be blurry, maybe there's two figure ones, the figures are poorly numbered. Uh, and your list of minor issues is where you wanna bring all those things up. Things that don't inf influence whether the paper should be published or not, but things that should be addressed before the paper is ultimately published. And this list of minor issues has a very, has a format that's very consistent uh, regardless of journal or, or other type of peer review that you're doing. And that is you try to say as specifically as possible in the manuscript where the problem occurs and then what the problem is and what the, your suggested resolution is. So if the manuscript has page and line numbers, uh, you can use those. So uh, on page six, line 10, uh, this word is misspelled, please correct the misspelling is, is a typical comment at this stage. Uh, very often in our experience, what reviewers want to do is to, mark, is to print off a copy of the manuscript, mark it up with a pen or pencil, scan it and send it back. Uh, I would discourage you from doing that, um, mostly because the publisher partners that we work with, the journal editors that we work with, will not pass that PDF on to the authors. It's just a matter of policy for them. It's something that we don't have control over. And so your efforts there are really just not, um, don't ever make it back to the authors. So this list of detailed comments is your opportunity to provide that level of feedback but you want to do it in terms of a written out list um, that involves page and or line numbers. Now, uh, the other thing that we see on occasion is that uh, sometimes reviewers will try to actually edit um, a paper for language in the context of a review. Um, I mean, I work at a company that provides language editing services, so uh, naturally, uh, I would discourage you from trying to do that, most for your benefit, not for ours primarily, because uh, it takes up a great deal of reviewer time for something that should be handled at another level. Uh, we have an article here um, that Teresa and I collaborated on uh, that I would direct your attention to if you're interested in this topic. So um, to summarize what I've just been saying, um, bad peer reviews are often very short. And they're bad not so much because of their content, but because of what they don't say. So you as a peer reviewer need to establish your credibility uh, with both the editor and also with the authors. So you have to show both of those parties that you have the appropriate expertise and that you've understood the content of the manuscript. So if you provide all of the elements that I've listed out uh, a little earlier in this talk, you go a long way towards um, providing that information that these parties need to determine that your opinion uh, should be taken into account. Uh, also, that list of comments goes back to this coaching thing that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. So the authors of the paper can use that to improve their work substantially before it's eventually published. So you're helping the authors a lot and you're helping the editor a lot by providing a firm basis for deciding whether or not uh, this particular paper can and should be published. So uh, you may be wondering at this point, well, I've never been invited to perform a peer review. Uh, where do I sign up? Uh, unfortunately, there isn't a web page that I can direct you to to sign up as, uh, as a peer reviewer. Uh, the way that this usually works is that Journal editors will get in a paper on a particular topic 
And then they will go looking on the internet for appropriate people to review that particular paper. And they'll invite one person, wait to see if they respond positively. If they don't hear back, they'll try the next person, so on and so forth. So the best way that you have of improving your chances of participating in this process, which is important for society, for other uh, scientists, and also for you and your development as a scientist, is to make sure that you are easily findable on the internet, that people can easily find you. And the information that you uh, need to provide is your a list of your publications because that establishes your your qualifications within a particular field of study, uh, your email address, and then so that people can reach out to you. But then also one thing that I've forgotten to include on this slide is also that you have a current academic affiliation. So usually editors want to invite someone who not only has a PhD and a list of publications within a particular topic, but also is currently associated with an academic institution. So if you meet all those criteria, then you're probably qualified to do a peer review and you should list all this stuff somewhere on the internet in the same place so that people can find you. So I've, I've listed a few possibilities here depending on your, your home country. You may have other options available to you, but uh, you can actually create profile pages within Google Scholar that satisfy this requirements. Uh, Researchgate.com uh, is a good place where I see lots of international researchers. Um, if you work at an institution, usually you can create an institutional web page. Um, it's also a great place to uh, list this, particularly if you're if that page is then connected back to a particular department or university where you work. So coming back again to the point of this talk, we're wrapping up here. Um, so when you're serving as a reviewer, uh, a lot of people think that that just means that you're providing an opinion about whether a paper should be published or not, but and that's the gatekeeper role. But you're also serving as a coach because the peer review process gives authors the opportunity to improve their work and uh, by providing detailed comments on how a given paper can be improved, uh, you're, you're fulfilling that coach role. You're helping those people to improve their work and get it out there. Uh, so when you do this, when you perform a peer review, you're helping society. You're helping society because the peer reviewed literature provides a basis for informed decision making and you're helping improve the quality of the scientific literature. Um, which then helps society because it can be used to make decisions. Uh, you're helping the authors of the paper, just like you, they want to publish high quality pu stuff as quickly as possible. Uh, if your comments are specific and actionable, you're helping them to do that. Uh, you're also helping yourself. You're becoming a better scientist. You see more papers. You get a sense of what other scientists think is important. Um, and uh, that, that helps you to improve your own work. Uh, if you want to participate in this process, uh, again, unfortunately, there's no place to just go sign up. Uh, but what you can do is you can create a web page or online profile that includes your publications, your institutional affiliation, and your email address. So um, I wanted to make sure that I spent a little bit of time talking about my employer here. Uh, so. I work for a company called Research Square, which includes AJE that I think many of you are familiar with. Uh, and we're committed to making research communication faster, fairer, and more useful. So uh, we do derive a profit from all of this work, but um, I think that the work that we do is, is definitely helpful to researchers and uh, publishers. And, and we're trying to make things better for the scientific community as we do all of this work. Uh, so we carry this out by developing innovative services for the global research community while preserving things that are already working. So we certainly support peer review, uh, but we're trying to make it better. And uh, we employ uh, former researchers and also people who have worked in the publishing industry, and we all work together to solve uh, critical issues facing scientific publishing. So my team uh, tries in particular tries to address the problem that peer review is very slow. So we try to make it faster and We're having great success at that So wrapping up, I want to make sure to thank uh, Teresa for setting up this webinar uh, some people that I work with who have
discuss this topic with me and also the team that I help supervise. And also thank all of you for, I want to thank all of you for uh, coming. Uh, it's fairly early in the morning here in the United States, but I believe it's uh, late at night in East Asia. And um, I don't know, probably mid afternoon in Europe, most places. So thank you all. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Teresa uh, to uh, take some questions. So Teresa, what have we uh, gotten in from, from people who have been attending the webinar? Um, so at this point, I have not seen any questions um, specific about peer review dropped in um, the Q&A or the chat box. We've had a, a few different questions about, you know, making sure that people re will receive slides and the recording. Um, but yes, if you have any questions, um, you know, related to giving a good peer review or, um, you know, even about peer review in general, now would be the time. Um, we mentioned this at the beginning, but there is a chat bar on the far right hand side. Um, of my screen at least, where you can type in um, your comments or questions. There is also a Q&A um, box at the bottom, kind of in the middle um, of, of this screen where you can type in questions. So um, yeah, we, we've set aside some time here at the end. We wanted to be able to, um, you know, in, in addition to share this information, just really be able to answer any questions that you all have about, um, you know, providing peer review and, and being able to do that. Um, so actually, it does look like, Patrick, we, we have one that just came in. Um, and this person asked, um, you know, how, um, you know, how can, um, peer review skills be improved regarding language skills of the reviewer as a non-English speaking person um, so that it is easily understandable and not lengthy. So how for someone whose um, native language is not English, um, you know, how can their peer review skills be reviewed so that they're making sure that they're delivering a review with language that is easy to understand and is not, you know, lengthy. Yeah. Uh, it's a good question. So um, what I would say here is that the important thing is to, is to try. So I understand. So what I can say about this is that um, I have lived abroad in Sweden and certainly there's a lot of English speakers in Sweden, but I also learned uh, Swedish while I was there. So I have a lot of sympathy for trying to communicate uh, with people in a technical context in a language that isn't your your first language. It's hard. Um, I think that the important thing is to try and to try not to be too self-conscious about it. So if you've been invited to provide a peer review, that's because the editor believes that you have the appropriate technical expertise to render a good decision on a particular article and some useful comments about it. So try to keep that in mind and think, all right, so at least the editor believes that, you know, I'm qualified to do this. So um, the other point that I would offer, you know, how do you write something that is as, as good as possible from a language perspective, try to write short sentences. So uh, depending on what your native language is, if it's not English, um, Many European languages, um, uh, many the speakers of many European languages, when they go to write in English, will write very long and fairly complex sentences. So, uh, what I would encourage you to do is to focus on writing short sentences instead. Um, so, if you want an English language author to try to imitate, that would be Ernest Hemingway. Uh, why do that? It turns out that if you write short sentences, that's actually considered really good uh, scientific style. And also it's really easy for um, native and non-native speakers to understand what you're trying to say. Uh, and it's easier for you as a non-native speaker to catch your mistakes when you do that, when you're writing short sentences. So to summarize what I've just said, um, the editor believes in your technical capabilities if you've been invited to offer a peer review, so try not to be too self-conscious about it. Uh, and then uh, write short sentences, 
uh, and that will help with um, the comprehension of, of what you write in your peer review. But it's a great question and it's something that I have a lot of sympathy for, so, so thank you for that. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and, and that's really good. Um, it looks, I was gonna say also thank you to everybody who um, is submitting your questions now. It looks like we do have, have several more. Um, so I, we're over here to our, our chat box. Um, uh, one person, and I don't know if you have anything to, to you know, just add to this or any tips um, really quickly, but one person did ask, um, would it be possible to have a webinar on how to respond to reviewer comments? So um, I don't know if you have, you know, obviously we, we can't go um, into a webinar on that right now, but I don't know if you have any, any high level tips or suggestions for anyone responding to reviewer comments that would be helpful. Yeah. Um... So I didn't come specifically prepared to, to speak on this topic, but um, I love the question. Um, and, and we do plan to give more of these webinars. So we have uh, webinars on how to write a good paper uh, and um, how to choose the right journal and now how to write a good peer review. So uh, adding one on responding to reviewer comments would be a great uh, addition to this series. Uh, what would I say about this? I would say that, you know, a bit like what I was saying a second ago. So when you are an author and you're receiving reviewer comments, the editor believes that the reviewers have the technical competence to, re to review your work, right? So, and it's the editor that ultimately determines whether or not your paper is going to get published. So, I believe me, I know uh, it can be very frustrating to read comments from strangers on your work that um, maybe are not the most positive. Uh, and you may even feel that the reviewers haven't understood your work well enough to comment on it. But you still have to respond to them. And so there's a few ways that you can do this. I would encourage you to read their comments and then set them aside for a week or something and then come back to them. Um, that's usually puts you in a better space mentally to respond to what they are saying. Uh, and then consider that these are intelligent, educated people who work in the same field as you, who have comments or questions about your manuscript. These are probably some of the same questions that a reader who doesn't know you when the papers eventually published would have about your work. So you should try to address all of the reviewer comments in the body of the paper uh, to the degree that you are able. Uh, sometimes if the reviewer is completely off base, you can just make the minimal possible adjustment to the body of the, to the text of the paper and then say, yes, thank you very much for this comment. Uh, to address it, we have changed the word and to or at this point in the manuscript and move on. So you've done something to change the paper, uh, but you have not given too much ground if, if you think the reviewer is just plain wrong. Um, but more often, what you are going to need to do is to take a breath and say, all right, this intelligent person didn't understand what I was saying. That probably means I haven't been clear enough so how can I adjust the manuscript in such a way that it will be clearer to future readers of the manuscript? So if you can master doing that, and it's hard, uh, you're going to become a better scientist because uh, what you eventually end up publishing will be better. So uh, I have spent a lot of time uh, being very frustrated with reviewers, uh, but most of the time, when I took the time to respond intelligently to what they were saying, uh, what eventually got published was better than what I had submitted originally. So I think it's very worthwhile to engage with what these people send you, even though it's really frustrating at times. I hope that helps. Yeah, that, that's excellent. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, oh, and we have a, we have an article about that, I think, on, on the, uh, 
It's not the Author Resource Center anymore. What is what is it called now? It's yeah, it, it is AJE Scholar. Um, it is, but it is our Author Resource Center, as Patrick said, and um, and he's correct. We do have an article called um, "How to How to Respond." I think the title was along the lines of responding to peer reviewers. Um, you know, and just there are some some examples of what you might want to say. Um, you know, in response to to some feedback that they've provided, um, with also suggestions. Of, of what might be, um, a, you know, a better phrasing or a better way to respond. Um, and that does come with downloadable content that is completely free um, and available. So yes, that is on um, our website. If you go to aje.com and free resources, that'll take you to where we have hundreds of articles with information. Um, so yeah, actually, thank you so much for, for referencing that. Um, the next question is, have you ever edited any paper that was really excellent and you didn't have to make any corrections? Um, good question. I'm sure it's happened. So um, as I've mentioned, I'm over on the other side of the company where we don't uh, really do language editing, but I did start uh, as a as an as an editor, so someone with an advanced degree who would edit work that was sent in uh, by scientists who were experts in their field but didn't have English as a first language, and so you know I clean up the language, and then um, we hope that that will lead as often as possible to those people being able to publish their papers. So I do have some direct experience with this. Um, it certainly happened that. Um, that some papers that we got in did have already a quite high standard of English. So we tried to edit things so that they sound as though they were written by a native speaker of English. Um, and we do uh, have a flag that editors can put on papers that's called a good original, uh, where we may offer someone a discount because we, we just didn't have to do very much to a particular paper. Um, so it, it certainly happens. Uh, it didn't happen a great deal um, in my particular fields. I think that uh, economists and business professionals turn out to be really good at writing in English as a field. Um, so, and, uh, and I didn't really add it in those areas, but um, uh, I'm, I'm drifting a little bit. Didn't happen often, but it does happen is what I'm trying to say. Awesome, thank you. Um, okay, so we do have um, several more questions. These are these are really good. Um, one person asks, "What if you were in doubt of either accepting a paper after major corrections or rejecting it? What should you do?" Yeah, it it's a good question. So um, I've I've been in the position a number of times of thinking to myself, I don't think this paper is really ready to be published, but I really like the science that the authors are doing and I appreciate what they're trying to accomplish. And, and that can be a hard situation for you to be in as a reviewer. I mean, you, you have a lot of sympathy for the authors of the paper. They're, you know, you, you can put yourself in their position. You want to help them. But, um, and you don't quite know what to do. I think that it is helpful at this point to remember that it's not you that makes the final decision, it is the editor. Uh, and so, um, you know, you, you don't have to stress too, too much. Now, I would say that editors are, in, in my experience, are quite ready to reject manuscripts. So uh, if you err on the side of being a little too lenient, um, that's probably a good place to start from. Um, but, you know, don't, I wouldn't sell yourself out by uh, recommending that something be published if you think it actually is fundamentally flawed. That ultimately doesn't help anyone. Uh, I've done that. Uh, it's something that I, that I regret having done. All right, thank you. Um, 
Great, so the, the next question is, as a reviewer, should I read all of the references that the author cited, or should I review from my own experience in this topic? Oh, wow, that, that's a great question, and um, I really thank you for bringing that up. Uh, so the list of references associated with any individual paper can stretch into the hundreds, so no, um, you should not read all of the papers. Um, I, I, hopefully, the editor has done a sufficiently a sufficiently good job of matching you to the paper that you will have some familiarity with the major articles that the uh, author is referencing. So no, you shouldn't read them all. Uh, it is on the authors of the paper to explain what they are talking about and the connection to the previous literature in such a way that someone with reasonable familiarity with the literature should have confidence that they have done their due diligence, okay? That they have understood the previous literature and also connected their work back to it. So if in reading the text of the paper that you're sent, you're not confident of that, then you should say so. You should say, I, you know, I don't think that the authors have really connected this to the previous literature. Now, um, you know, it may happen that you read a statement in a paper followed by a citation and you think, I know that reference and the authors of this manuscript have misstated what this paper actually says. Uh, when that happens, you should certainly point it out. But um, I wouldn't go uh, digging into the references uh, unless, unless something that the authors say gives you a bad feeling about what they're saying and you, you want to verify uh, your, your, your sense of it. Uh, that's rare. Uh, so, so to circle back to your question, no, you sh you're not expected to read all the references. Um, you know, if you find yourself in a position where uh, you might have to in order to assess a paper, it's probably time to say to the editor, I'm sorry, I don't have the necessary expertise to review this. Uh, please try to find someone else. And you can do that. Great, thank you, Patrick, for um, for answering that. And that was that was a really good question. Um, it does look like we have about five questions left. Um, does that? I was going to say, Patrick, do you feel like we have the time to to address those, or do you want to take just a few more? Uh, I have about ten more minutes, so let's um, continue for a little while, and then uh, we'll see where that leaves us. How does that sound? That sounds great. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, some publishers restrict the scope of review by providing a reviewer's comment format, which can be frustrating or could be frustrating because the reviewer may not be able to exhaust all of her um, observations. Is there anything that can be done to address this? Um, how publishers can restrict the scope of review um, due to the comment format? Well, uh, I think the short answer is no. Uh, ultimately, if you've been uh, solicited to provide a review uh, by a publisher that restricts um, the length or, or nature of the comments you can send back, it's kind of what you've signed up for. Uh, I mean, you could potentially email the editor with additional comments, but as I've mentioned, they don't seem to like marked up PDFs. So um, I would say that editors have a hard job. So they are generally, I mean, think back to that graphic that I was showing you. Two, two million articles get published every year, which means that about four million peer reviews have to be solicited every year. That's a huge volume. Uh, distributed across the global population of editors. So these people are super busy and they probably only have the bandwidth to process comments of a particular kind. So if they're telling you these are the types of comments that they want, that's probably because those are the comments that are most useful to them in uh, helping authors to improve their work and then ultimately publishing it, hopefully. So. Uh, I would urge you, if, if someone has been that specific in telling you what they want, 
to uh, take that as, as strong guidance and try to do what they've asked you because that's ultimately going to be most helpful for both the authors and the editors. That's really good. Um, thank you for that. The next question is, are there some websites that provide guidelines and materials that help reviewers, especially speakers um, whose non-native language is English? Um, I'm sorry, Teresa, could you repeat the first part of that? So websites and resources that, um, that, that provide guidance on how to do reviewing, especially for non-native speakers. Is, is that a, a fair statement? It is, yeah. So websites yeah. that provide guidelines and materials um, that would help reviewers, especially those whose, whose first language is not English. Like, are there yeah. any that you know of or that you might recommend? Um, so this is an area where I don't have a lot of direct familiarity, unfortunately. I'm, I believe that if you uh, search for how do I write a peer review, you'll probably get a selection of blog posts and other things, um, many of which will be written by practicing scientists and offer useful thoughts. So if you do, some, do a searching in that way, you'll probably find a post written by somebody in your actual field of study, and that then will be more directed towards um, things that you might wanna write than the sort of general advice that I'm offering here. Although I think that what I'm saying should apply to, to basically any peer review. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, material specifically for, for non-native speakers of English. Uh, you know, we try to, to do some of this through the, um, through AJE Scholar. Uh, so I, but I'm, I'm not really aware of specific resources for non-native speakers. You might check your site with your scientific societies in your country of origin. So here in the United States, we have um, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, so, I mean, I, it's not really fair because of course English is right now the lingua franca of science. I'm sure it'll be Chinese in another uh, 50 years or something like that. But uh, you know, if there's a, a scientific society for scientists in general in your home country, I would check with them to see what they have to say about peer review. Um, the other resource that I could point out here, it's a little specific to one topic, but uh, the American Chemical Society has a series of uh, has a short course on how to do peer reviews uh, that, again, our former colleague Ben Mudrak uh, was very influential in creating. So uh, that may or may not be helpful to you because you may not be a chemist or a chemical engineer, uh, but there could be uh, useful stuff in there. Uh, so check it out. I'm sorry that that was less direct than you probably wanted, but um, I think this is this is an important area that's probably underserved right now. Yeah, that's really good. And thank you for, for yes, referencing the short course that ACS um, does offer on peer review. Um, another colleague of ours actually has taken that course and, um, and she wrote an article about it on our Author Resource Center, AJA Scholar, and um, I think she found, um, you know, it to provide valuable information. So, and I think it's free to anyone of any, any researcher in any field. So it, um, it does seem like a good resource for, for people. Um, another question that we received is, could you talk about how um, the editor of a journal makes decisions about reviewer comments, um, you know, and the reviewer's decisions? So for example, they've said, and you know, let's say that an editor receives four decisions from the reviewers. Um, one is accept, one is minor revision, um, another is minor revision, and one is reject. Um, so I, th I think the question is just asking, you know, can, can you share any insight on how, you know, a journal editor makes the decisions once they receive these recommendations from reviewers? Uh, 
you know that that's a really great question um so that is a part of the process into which i have no direct experience so i have i mean speaking as somebody who has been an individual scientist i will say i certainly had frustrating experiences where one or two reviewers liked the paper and then the third reviewer didn't like the paper and the paper got rejected so um i think it depends a lot on uh the editors at that point and their sense of your paper do they like it or not um there may be policies at individual journals about you know maybe some fraction of the reviewers have to be positive towards a paper in order to accept it um i i i think that that would really depend and and i don't have specific insight here unfortunately so i'm sorry i can't give you a better answer to your question um if if you know if this is something that you're about to submit one of your first papers and you're concerned about how it'll be received uh it's just a risk you have to take go ahead and submit and hope for the best uh if it's a situation that you're presently in i'm uh, i'm sorry for that and i i hope it gets resolved well awesome thank you so much patrick um Okay, so one one other question that we have, I mean, we have a couple more, but I want to be mindful of, of everyone's time. So um, another question that we have is, um, what should I do if I think that the paper is good, but not for this journal? Um, they said they mean the work that is presented should be published in a higher or a, low, in a, or a lower journal. Um, so what should they do in that particular case? Yeah, I mean, you can certainly say that um it is it is not inappropriate for you to say in the context of a review um you know i i i support the publication of this manuscript i i think it uh should be published in in a different journal perhaps journal you know the journal of such and such right uh you can do that but but let's consider again the editor and the authors um the authors have have made the decision to submit to this particular journal maybe they already tried the journal that you're suggesting and got rejected from it so um you know at, at that point the the suggestion just isn't you know they're not going to be able to work on that act with that suggestion the editor has apparently made the decision that the paper is at least broadly appropriate for this journal because they've chosen to send it out for review. So they make some decision about the suitability of the paper before you ever see it. Um, usually in our system, so as I mentioned, we see hundreds of peer reviews every single month. Uh, we do something that's called double blind peer reviewing where uh, the reviewer does not know who wrote the paper or even what journal it is for. Uh, usually sometimes reviewers want to know what journal it's for and and it simply doesn't matter at that stage okay because again the editor has made a decision this paper is appropriate for my journal if it's publishable so i want to send it out for review so i would really encourage you to uh, rely on the editors to make that decision because you know that that's kind of what what they do your job is to um assess the quality of the science at that point and see whether the author's claims are supported by the data that they're presenting. That's great. Thank you for that. Um, Let's do so, one more. Um, yeah, I was, I was going to say, um, we can, we can go ahead and wrap up. I, I know that we had a couple of questions that we didn't get to. So if you want to respond to the email that, um, that we're going to send out with the webinar recording and the slides, um, then you're welcome to do that. And we'll be able to answer those as, as best as we can, um, and make sure that, that you have the information that you're looking for. Um, so just as a, a follow up to that, as I said, we will be sending out a link to the recording as well as a link to view the slides um, to everyone who signed up. So you will have all of this information and be able to review it, um, you know, as, as you need or as you desire going forward. Um, 
Thank you to everyone who attended today and thank you for these incredible questions and, um, you know, and, and being willing to, to ask them, you know, many that, that probably others um, in this setting can relate to. So thank you. Thank you for that and for your attendance. And thank you again, Patrick, for delivering this incredible webinar with this um, great information that um, I think is, is really useful um, and is really interesting. So thank you so much for your time, um, you know, and for everything everyone for all of your time today um, to attend and be here with us. So yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you, Teresa, for organizing this. And uh, we're going to have more of these. So uh, if you liked this, um, we're really glad. Uh, so keep your eyes peeled for um, future webinars. And, and we love these comments. I mean, that's an important part of our questions. That's, that's an important part of the reason why I do these in the first place. So thanks for coming and offering uh, these great questions.